Well, welcome everyone. We're very happy to have you with us for this CURES Club event. Uh, you all know CURES stands for Comprehensive Understanding via Research and Education into Schizophrenia. And we are just delighted to have Dr. Robert McCollum Smith with us tonight as our special guest, who uh, completed his BS degree at Indiana University with highest distinction and honor to 1990. He has MD and PhDs from the University of Michigan. He's been funded for 16 years by the NIMH, has won numerous awards. Today, he is uh, currently chair of the neurosciences department at the University of Toledo College of Medicine, and he is the research director of the ProMedica Neuroscience Center in Toledo, Ohio. So welcome, Dr. McCollum Smith. Hey, Bethany, thanks for the invite. It's, it's an honor and a privilege to be here and talk with this group. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful opportunity to share thoughts and it's always flattering to think that someone might want to hear me rant or say something about schizophrenia or mental illness or life or whatever. Um, some of you may have, have tuned in early and, Beth and I, Bethany and I were talking about whether or not I was going to show slides or not. And um, you know, my thought was having done similar sort of presentations, if you will, with other groups is that I'm very happy to have this be extraordinarily interactive. It's a little bit harder remotely than uh, being able to be in the room and, and you know get a sense for when people want to say something or talk. Um, it's kind of hard for me to follow the chat um, while I'm in presenter mode. So maybe Bethany can help me with that. If someone tosses a question out in the chat, I'm happy to pause whatever we're talking about at the time and answer a question. I mean, the, the goal here is not for you to for me to tell you what I think you want to hear, but the goal is for me to talk about things that you actually want to hear about. Um, based on some interactions with Bethany, she said that um, a little while back, uh, you guys had a meeting and talked about possible topics uh, for me to talk about. Um, and so I have that list in front of me. And so that's kind of where I was going to start. And um, the most an important thing, anytime you're talking to physician is disclosures. I actually now do have something to disclose. I'm the chief scientific officer for CSI Genetics, which is a little startup looking to do uh, telemedicine type things. Um, nothing I'm talking about tonight will have any reflection on that, but that's a disclosure of a, of a fiduciary relationship that I have. Otherwise, nothing to disclose. Um, it says here, they want to hear about your journey from high school through finishing your MD, PhD, and into your current career. That is such a big and wide open uh, question, but I think this graphic is nice. It's a little bit incomplete um, as I threw this slide in just a minute ago, but here's, here's how the rant goes. So I did 12 years of grade school, um, mostly in rural Indiana, Ellettsville, Indiana. And then I went to uh, college for four years. Uh, and graduated from Indiana University in 1990. And then from there, I went to the University of Michigan. And from 1990 to 1997, I was in the dual degree program. It has a special name. It's called the Medical Scientist Training Program. And you come out of that program as a double doctor, a medical doctor and a doctor of philosophy, which is what a PhD is. My PhD topic was pathology. And then I stayed on there for five years and did a psychiatry residency that's a research track. So psychiatry residency is normally four years. And for those of you that don't know, going to medical school really doesn't qualify you to do anything. You have to do postgraduate training in a specialty typically, at least a minimum of one year to get a, to get a practicing license. In psychiatry, it's traditionally four years of additional training beyond med school. In my case, I did five and combined it with a bunch of research. So if you add that up, it's 12 plus four is 16, seven years of MD, PhD, that's 23, and then five years of residency. I went to school for 28 years and um, 28 grades, if you will. And what I have to say about that is my, my stepfather, Jerry, who, who died a number of years ago, used to, whenever I'd come home for the holidays, he's like, when are you going to get a real job? How are you doing in class? Even though I was like, a, you know, a fourth year MD, PhD, psychiatry residency, it just seems like school never ended. The other thing I'll have to say about that is this, this is something you want to do. You really have to like taking tests because the tests just never end. And there's a lot of them and they come at you from different directions. Um, 
So I'm going to pause there, Bethany, and ask if anyone has any specific questions about college or medical school or why psychiatry or any of those decision points. Sometimes people have a lot of questions about that. You can all feel free to speak up. All of you are muted, I believe, but if you unmute yourself and would like to speak up, you're welcome to at this time. I'm curious how you chose psychiatry or what influenced in your um, pathway to choose psychiatry. Well, there's a lot of fun jokes about that. That the original joke about that is doctor heal thyself, right? Um, the myth, and it may have a lot of truth to it, is a lot of people go into things that they're drawn to, you know, because of something in their family or whatever. Um, for me, it's 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 a story that I think I've told Bethany, but I I don't often share because I don't get asked this question very often. So I was I grew up in a culture of death. When I was a high school kid and a college student, around me, lots of suicides, people being killed by drunk drivers, um, really awful sort of tragic things. Um, one, one person who kill, killed, committed suicide when I was in high school was an acquaintance of mine from marching band. And he did it in a car in his parents' garage and accidentally killed his whole family because the garage was attached to the house. And so, you know, and that's not the worst story. I'm, I'm not going to share more. I don't want to be too graphic, but, and I didn't really realize that, that I had this um, life experience being around people who had had all this loss and knowing people that apparently were in great pain really until the end of medical school. So I got to the end of medical school. The third year, so the third year of medical school, you try out all these different fields. You do surgery, internal medicine, pathology, neurology, family medicine, whatever. And I did surgery and I spent the whole time talking to patients and writing their notes because I didn't want to be in the operating room. That was boring. And at the end of surgery, I'm like, wow, I love this rotation. And I didn't really realize that what I loved was talking to patients. So I got to the very end of the third year and I was choosing between psychiatry and pathology. And that's when I kind of figured out, wow. I really enjoy talking to people and every person is unique. Like the psyche of every person is incredibly unique. Whereas if I'm doing a, you know, take down an appendix laparoscopically, that would just get boring. Like appendix after appendix after appendix. Every now and then it might get exciting if one ruptures, not exciting for the patient, exciting because it's a more difficult case. But the psychiatry just fascinated me. And then when I, I melded that with my personal experiences, it just was a natural fit. And I'm one of those, I, I consider myself very fortunate because I love my job. So that's a great question. So I'll shut up there. If, there a, if there's a follow-up to that, throw it out or anybody has questions about that. I'm happy to talk more, but. Feel free to speak up. <laughs> Okay, uh, Dr. McCollum Smith, I guess I'll you keep going. Going. I'll keep going. So one of the things I get asked, I, I study in the laboratory um, is schizophrenia. Um, and of course, that's apropos to cures, because it has a little bit to do with schizophrenia, right, Bethany? I hope so. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a field that is, I think it's in its teenage years. You know, there's other fields that are much more advanced. Um, cancer biology is much more advanced. Um, treating viruses is much more advanced. You know, we now have, have, have treatments for both HIV and hepatitis C. You know, when I was a kid, those were killers. You, you just didn't live. And now it's just managing a chronic condition. Um, schizophrenia is not that way. We're, we're you know, we're where ca the cancer field was in the 1970s with schizophrenia. And the, the schizophrenia syndrome is really interesting to think about. It's, it's a name that came from a convention. So how do you name something schizophrenia? How do you name what it was before it was called schizophrenia? It was called dementia praecox. And literally a bunch of white Caucasian European men in the 1880s, 1890s sitting around in a room decided that if you have this pattern of symptoms and signs, you get this label, okay? And the problem with that is that's not a rigorous way 
to sort out mechanism of action, cause, treatment, et cetera, targets for treatment. And the, the counter example I can give is diabetes. So type one diabetes is an illness where you no longer make insulin, right? And the islet cells in your pancreas don't make insulin and they may have been killed by a virus or a genetic lesion or some sort of toxin. Those causes are known. And when you stop making insulin, your blood glucose level goes up really high and you get diabetic ketoacidosis. And if you don't get an intervention, you're gonna have a really bad outcome. That's a disease. We know the cause, we know the mechanism. Schizophrenia is a syndrome. It's just sort of an agglutination of signs and symptoms. It's a pattern. And if you have that pattern, we give you the diagnosis. So that's problematic because it really doesn't lead to anything that could be sort of logically driven from a treatment standpoint. And this, the slide you're seeing right now is an example of that. Genetic risk for schizophrenia. Less than 1% of the cases are due to a sort of what we call a rare mutation, a really rare mutation. And then there's another bucket or tranche or whatever you want to call it of genetic risk that are called copy number variations. And it's exactly what it sounds like. More or less genes than you're supposed to have. The same gene might be duplicated or triplicated or quadruplicated, or it might be missing. And that's a copy number variant. And that's about two to three percent of the genetic risk for schizophrenia. And then there's these little things that form the base of the pyramid called single nucleotide polymorphisms. And they're not called mutations. And what in the world is a polymorphism? Single makes a lot of sense. It means one. Nucleotide, that's referring to the base pair in your DNA. And a polymorphism is a really overly complicated word that just means different. So sometimes a person will have an A or an adenosine in a certain spot, and other times they might have a different nucleotide. They might have a G, a guanine, or something like that, right? Or a cytosine. And these, these bases form up the genetic code. Well, we have normal variation in those sort of in certain places in the genome, and we call those polymorphisms. So you may have a family that has a certain set of polymorphisms and another family that has a different set. You may have new polymorphisms popping up in every generation. We don't call them mutations because they're generally not associated with a severe, obvious, highly penetrant sort of feature, right? You know, the thing that you could think about as an example is Down syndrome. Down syndrome is a trisomy. It's an extra chromosome. It's a, basically a massive copy number variation. Down syndrome has a very obvious phenotype. It has a morphology that you can recognize. It has changes in brain function. Single nucleotide polymorphisms don't have an obvious sort of link. To study them, you need thousands of patients. And in the case of schizophrenia, you, you needed uh, you know, more than 100,000 probably. In the, the big genetic studies right now that are looking at genome-wide association between different polymorphism flavors have hundreds of thousands of patients in them. And most of the risk for schizophrenia is sitting in that polymorphism bucket, 97, 98% of it. Okay. There's a question in the chat. I'm going to take a peek. Does knowing which category your loved one belongs to affect treatment at all? Uh, that's a great question. So by category, I think you mean genetic category. Is that right? I'm going to look back in the chat. Yes. Sorry, sorry. Yes, that's what I meant. Like knowing where on this pyramid your loved one belongs to. Yeah, I, I would say that that could be useful. And so the genetics field has developed for schizophrenia a thing called a, a risk score, a polygenic risk score. And the polygenic risk score gives you sort of a sense of how much risk you have for schizophrenia based on the known risk factors. And the, the, the thing of it is there are mutations, there are copy number variants, there are single nucleotide polymorphisms that cause changes, biochemical changes in the brain and body that occasionally can be treated with existing drugs. And they aren't the kind of thing that you would give to a thousand schizophrenia patients. It's the kind of thing that you would customize and only give to one or two. Um, so an example I can give you 
in a, in a related field, a developmental disorder, there's, there's a subject or a patient that I know, and I can't give you specific details, you know, who it is and all that, who has a mutation in a glutamate receptor. And it's in a part of the glutamate receptor that binds to D-serine, which is an amino acid that is made by astrocytes and other parts of the body. And because this patient's receptors don't have a good response to D-serine, this patient's being treated with oral doses of D-serine to try to boost the D-serine level to try to overcome that block in some of the receptors. So it can be useful. Um, and there's places that do that. The other thing that, that we've done and it's not something that's part of the clinical treatment protocol, it's more of a research protocol, is patients with schizophrenia will sometimes uh, donate a sample. It could be a blood sample. It used to be a, a skin biopsy, but we don't do that anymore because we don't need to, to put somebody through a, you know, a punch or taking a little punch of their skin. Um, but a blood sample, or now even sometimes with a urine sample, we can isolate the stem cells in the blood or the urine, some stem cells, or some epithelial cells, and we can program them, reverse program them into cells that look like brain cells. So they're called inducible pluripotent stem cells or iPSCs. This doesn't have anything to do with the political uh, wars uh, during W. Bush's presidency over whether or not you can use embryonic stem cells. We're not talking about embryonic stem cells at all or embryonic tissue, we're talking about adult tissue that gets reverse programmed into stem cells. And then those stem cells can be encouraged to turn into neurons or astrocytes or other brain cells. They can even be encouraged to grow what we call mini brains, which are these little organoids. So it's, it's possible uh, to take a blood sample and grow brain cells for a living patient and then test those cells directly for different features. And there's this whole sort of tranche of uh, glutamate receptor um, variants, we'll call them. I'm not going to call them mutations. And that have been discovered in different people. Some of them have schizophrenia, some have autism, some have intractable seizures. It can present a lot of different ways. And those receptors have been studied in cell systems to see what the best treatments would be. Again, research protocol, not a clinical protocol. So that's, that's an interesting question. The way I would answer it, the other way I would answer that question is, would I get one of my kids tested, have their, their, their genome sequenced if they had something like this? And the answer is yes. And you don't have to be a millionaire to do it anymore. It used to be really expensive to, to sequence someone's genome, but it can be done for a lot less money now. So yeah, I would absolutely do it. But I'm I'm not a good I'm not good at denial. I would want to know. <laughs> I totally respect that people don't want to know what's in their DNA. So, so when you get like those um, uh, tests done when you're pregnant, like this, like the genetic screening test, mm -hmm. is this something that they screen for, or it would have to be you have to specifically request it? As far as I know, the genetic screening tests, the prenatal screening tests, don't include schizophrenia risk genes. Um, okay. There are panels of risk genes um, in, for, for the pediatric medicine arena. There's a panel of common genes that are tested if someone looks like they have a developmental disorder now. But uh, when the, the child is in utero and there's ways to, to get at their DNA, um, the, the typical screening has not, does not include risk genes for schizophrenia. And I'm gonna, that's a great segue. So let's, let me go. Let me try to make my slides move. There we go. So I want to I want to segue. That's a great segue. So to something that you guys might find interesting. So at the top of the pyramid, these rare mutations. I'm going to talk about a rare mutation and make a make a couple of points about it. So this is a family pedigree. If you haven't seen one, um, each sort of diamond or square-like thing is a person. And and I'm not trying to dehumanize anybody. Anybody. This is just how pedigrees are done. And um, in this case, the way the information is coded is if you have a filled in diamond all the way, that's a person that was diagnosed with schizophrenia when they were living. 
if you have a half filled in diamond and the bottom of it's filled, it's anxiety or, or alcoholism. If it's filled into the right, it's depression. If it's got a dot in it, it's bipolar disorder and so on and so forth. You can see the, you can see the, um, the, the sort of chart that explains everything at the bottom, okay? And what, are, what does the asterisk mean? There's a little star by some of the, the cases. The asterisk means that that subject, that patient, that person has a, a rare mutation. And it's a very specific mutation. It's a translocation of two chromosomes. So they get kind of get, they get swapped. And the point where they get swapped breaks a gene. It breaks a gene in half. And that gene is called DISC or DISC. And so this is a, a pedigree of a family with the DISC mutation. And um, what we see here is if you have an asterisk, you're carrying the DISC mutation. And the DISC mutation was named DISC, was named that disrupted in schizophrenia, DISC, disrupted in schizophrenia, because seven of the carriers have schizophrenia. If you look at all the rare mutations in the world that are known, this is the mutation that is the best smoking gun for causing schizophrenia. All right. It's what we would call highly penetrant. Most of the time, if you have a schizophrenia risk gene, you're not going to have schizophrenia necessarily. Okay. The, the amount of risk conferred by some of those little, those little things I talked about, those polymorphisms. SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, the relative risk each one of those costs, causes is really small, maybe 1.1. When one is no, no risk, 1.1 is a tiny little bit more risk. DISC, this DISC mutation, it's a rare mutation, tip of the pyramid. It causes a very high amount of risk. And it's really our best smoking gun for genetic risk for schizophrenia. Okay. I told you that story so I could tell you this, this, the next part of the rant. 11 of the carriers have a mood disorder and don't have schizophrenia. Think about that. They got all excited. They named the protein after schizophrenia because seven patients had schizophrenia. But when they look closer, 11 of the carriers, more than have schizophrenia, have a severe mood disorder. It should have never been called disrupted in schizophrenia. It should have been called disrupted in severe mental illness. And the problem is, is when you get genetics interacting with the environment, stress, drugs of abuse, sleep deprivation, whatever, whatever the stressors are, whatever the risk factors are, immigrating, marijuana use before the age of 18, there's a number of risk factors for catching schizophrenia. Whatever, whenever you mix that together, the phenotypic outcome can be highly variable. So you have genetic risk, you roll the environmental dice for what happens during development or whatever, and out comes depression or out comes bipolar disorder. The same genetic lesion can manifest in very, very different ways. And that gets back to what I opened with, that schizophrenia was a descriptive thing, it was described by people who saw a pattern. Nothing wrong with that. That's how all medicine starts, but it does not have a foundation in genetics and physiology. It has a foundation in an observation of traits. And what this example shows you, you can't use observable traits to say something about the mechanism. It'll fool you every time. So I'll shut up there because that's, nice, that's a nice rant to stop and let you catch your breath and I'll take a drink of water and see if anybody has a comment. Yeah, we welcome any questions at this point. Thank you for such an interesting example. Anyone? Oh, I have my list, Bethany. They already, they gave me all the questions. I uh -huh. Okay. We'll keep I don't going. see anything in the chat. Um, so I'll make one more point about that concept. People all the time say, oh, you're in the laboratory. I study human postmortem brain. So people who have uh, passed away from schizophrenia, either they before they died or their families donated the brains to science and the brains are collected by brain banks. The brain banks share the tissues with certain labs and we study what's different in those brains. It can maybe help us understand the illness. 
There's other ways to study diseases. You can have an animal model of a disease. You could have an animal model of diabetes. You could have an animal model of dementia. And so there's been a lot of animal models of so-called mousy schizophrenia, okay? And they all have the same sort of bucket of things. They have PPI, which is a sensory deficit. They have memory deficits. They have the animal equivalent of psychosis, which is hyper uh, motor activity, increased activity. They have potentially have grooming deficits, which could be a sign of problems with, you know, uh, the negative symptoms of schizophrenia and so on and so forth. They're not perfect endophenotypes, but that's the best they got. Here's the problem. If you look at the list on the far left, you can break the brain a gazillion different ways and get the same mousy schizophrenia phenotype. NMDA receptor, broken, sure. Lesion the hippocampus, sure. Lesion the cortex, you got it. Poly IC challenge, which is an immune simulating in a, a viral infection, same thing. MAM, which is an anti-mitotic agent given at a very specific time, you get all this stuff. And then the transgenic animals just go on and on and on. There's just the whole list of them. Every different neurotransmitter system, if you disrupt it, you can get mousy schizophrenia. So the animal models are really not very useful because they do not recapitulate in any consistent way whatever's going on in the human. Dr. Michael Smith, could you talk more about what mousy schizophrenia looks like? I, I always wonder about that myself. Yeah, and, and it's it's a fun rant. Um, I'm just looking in the chat. I promise to answer that, Isabel, in a second. So when I say mousy schizophrenia, it's perhaps a misnomer. It's So if we're going to study animals and study humans, which is something that we do, can we create a, a group of mice that have schizophrenia-like behaviors. Well, you can't ask a mouse if it's hearing voices. <laughs> a mouse can't tell you that it thinks President Obama was born in Sudan and has a paranoid delusion. So the problem is, is that we have to have sort of indirect measures or sort of what we would call analogous features. And hyperactivity in a rodent or, or locomotor, increased locomotor activity is considered a proxy for psychosis. And there's a lot of research to back that up. Um, all right, Peter, let's go to these questions in the chat. Are most postmortem studies, are postmortem so health studying schizophrenia than live subjects and they're most accessible? Yeah, and you know, there's no way to get at the brain tissue in a living patient other than imaging. And imaging is limited in how low you can go in terms of resolution. You can't get to the cell level in an MRI machine or a PET scan, you can in a little bit in a PET scanner, but not really. Um, and so one of the things we can do with postmortem tissues is we can look at the synapses and the molecules and the mitochondria and the transporters. We can look at stuff directly um, that we can't really do that in, in live subjects. The, the field of studying um, living subjects with schizophrenia is a very important field. It's not my direct field, I know a lot of people that do that, and it's very important and has been very helpful to, to figuring some things out, but it's it's very different. All right, so we're still going in the chat here. All right, do the lower two categories of etiologies have the same variable expression clinically based on environmental factors? Lower two categories. Do you mean the lower two categories of genetic risk or on the table I'm showing? Yeah, I don't know. All right, pyramid, I got it. Thank you, Peter. Let me, let me try to get back to the pyramid and then I'll come back to the chat, I promise. All right, so we're back to the pyramid. So that's a great question. How does, how do the, do the um, risk factors for schizophrenia sort out by these, have they been sorted by these three? I actually don't know the answer to that. I have not seen a paper that sorts patients into these three buckets of genetic risk and then delineates the risk factors. I think the environmental factors are so hard to tease out. It would be very difficult to have enough subjects, particularly just with rare mutations or just with copy number variants. Although there is a 22Q11 deletion syndrome that counts probably as a copy number variant that there are enough subjects to study 
their schizophrenia rate is, I don't remember off the top of my head, I think it's about 50%, and it's kind of a different illness. Um, I would say that in terms of answering that question, the environmental factors would most appropriately apply to the bottom bucket, the single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, please talk more about this as a trigger factor, thanks. So the, the prevailing hypothesis is that you have genetic risk for schizophrenia. Um, in some cases, that may be as high as 80%, 60, 70, 80% uh, risk, that the, in combination with environmental factors, it's a developmental illness where um, developmental processes set up brain circuits in a way that as the brain matures through the teenage years, things start to not work so good. And one of the ideas is that the genetic risk centers in on excitatory synapses. And excitatory synapses are found all over the brain on excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons and things like that. And that there's some interaction between the, the makeup of excitatory synapses and the immune system causing some of these excitatory synapses to be depleted or removed when they shouldn't be removed. It's called this sort of the synapse depletion hypothesis. That's kind of the, the latest and greatest hypothesis linking the genetic risk. How would, um, how would some of the things we talked about, anything that stresses the brain in your mid to late teenage years is bad for schizophrenia. You wouldn't want to have that. Um, somebody who has... Um, a history of trauma, physical or sexual trauma, that's that's a risk factor. So things that um, stress the brain, things that activate the stress systems tend to be considered um, putting people at risk for converting into from a maybe a prodromal or a clinically high risk patient into a patient with schizophrenia as a diagnosis. I don't know if that was helpful that's a little bit outside my area, but I, I review a lot of grants and papers on those topics, so I can say something about, about that. Um, I think I missed, maybe missed a question. Let's see here. Peter, can you confirm that I answered all your questions or, oh, here we go, Rowan. Oh, yeah, doctor, doctor, if I can just clarify. So you had said with the mutation, the top pyramid, you gave that that chart of all the patients yes. uh, in the family. And you, you basically said that the same genetic disorder depending on the environment, can turn into two or three different um, disease states, so to speak. Is that the same for the lower part of the pyramid, that that same polynuclide? Yeah, you know, that's, that's definitely, that's probably definitely true because there's a lot of overlap um, in terms of the single nucleotide polymorphism. Some of those SNPs are also implicated in depression and bipolar disorder, more so in bipolar disorder but there is overlap of the genetic risk between for the single nucleotide polymorphisms between these, you know, big, for lack of a better word, big axis one psychiatric disorders, schizophrenia, schizoaffective, and bipolar disorder have a lot of overlap. And depression too? Not as much, but some. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, Rowan Sampson says, you mentioned emigrating as an environmental factor. Is this really so common? Please talk more about this as a trigger factor and why might this be a trigger? So I've, you know, there's, there's particularly a literature, again, I'm not a, an epidemiological uh, uh, card carrying epidemiologist, but there's a literature on emigrating from Central Africa in particular is a risk factor. Emigrating in general is a risk factor. And it's thought that the, the sort of dissociation of being immersed in a different culture can be very stressful psychologically. It can be, it can cause a lot of anxiety. It can change your immune function. Um, why, why is it specifically higher risk for Central Africa? I don't know the answer to that. And I wouldn't even be able to speculate it's just been identified as a as a as a risk factor and something we think about when we see patients. Does that help, Rowan? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Too. Yeah, that's good, Rowan. I'm getting close. Hopefully. 
Yeah. Those are all uh, excellent questions. Um, before we move on, does anyone else have any other questions apropos to the topics we just beat up? I don't see any in the chat, so I'll try to make my slides move again. So I think I already mentioned this, but you know, when you take all of that genetic risk I talked about, what does it do, right? And for a long time, people thought it was the story of inhibitory neurons, but it really turns out to be probably all excitatory neurons. And um, this is just a, a, a GWAS is a, a fancy name for how, studying those polymorphisms, those little things, the SNPs. GWAS is a way to study SNPs. This is where you need hundreds of thousands of patients and somebody took those genes that are associated with that and said, hey, what do they do? And that's what you see here, synaptic transmission, synaptic signaling, all this stuff. It's, it's synaptic. So this is about synapses. The genetic risk is about what I call broken synapses. A um, couple of comments in the chat. Let's see if I can find them. All right, let's see here. So we'll try to get these in order. Maggie Gilbert, Beck, Beckyard, I think I said that right. So I read that boys living in the city are more likely to develop schizophrenia. So um, the rates of schizophrenia in rural versus urban areas, the last time I looked, were the same, relatively the same. The rates of schizophrenia do not vary by socioeconomic locale or situation. The rates of affluent 1% income earners are the same as people who are below the poverty line. The rates are very similar all over the world. However, you talk about city versus country, city mouse versus country mouse, people who live in rural areas tend to have a less severe course than people who live in the city. There are hypotheses about why that is, the last time I looked at that, which may have been a decade ago, um, there was no final answer. I could speculate. Um, the speculation I was taught when I was in training is that's because there's less stimulation in the rural setting. There's less opportunities uh, for, but I don't know that that holds water. Um, I suspect that in rural areas, um, there's, um, a different type of support network than in urban areas. Um, maybe it's a little easier in urban areas for a person with schizophrenia who gets psychotic to fly under the radar and they maybe they don't get the help they need. I don't know, but that's definitely, there's definitely a difference in the severity. At least that's been documented in the past. Oh, this is great. I know you said it, you aren't an epidemiologist. Let me get my hat on that says epidemiologist, fake, fake epidemiologist. I'm wondering if you've heard about body changes like sensory loss and amputation causing stress that could trigger schizophrenia. I have not heard about that. Um, I've heard about um, psychological trauma triggering psychotic breaks that looked prodromal to schizophrenia. There's an interesting side point here. Schizophrenia doesn't just involve the central nervous system. It also involves the peripheral nervous system. And persons with schizophrenia often have abnormalities of pain and temperature sensing. And this has been studied um, in a few studies. Again, I haven't looked at this literature in a long time, but there's, there's a literature on um, uh, pain sensation. There's a literature on um, uh, temperature sensation. Um, Anecdotally, you will sometimes see persons with schizophrenia wearing winter coats in the middle of the summer, and they're not sweating and they're not overheating. Um, that's anecdotal. I'm not saying that's based on anything scientific. And um, but yeah, the the peripheral nervous system, the nerves in patients with schizophrenia are definitely affected. It's definitely a thing, and and there also may be an impact on the nerves in the gut, but nobody's really studied that a lot. So those are all excellent questions. Um, so again, feel free to unmute or keep throwing them in the chat. That's excellent. I'm gonna close that box.
and continue down this current rant and say if there's something else about this. So um, I don't want to talk about that, I don't think. So this is something I want to talk about a little bit. Um, so there's this idea that um, schizophrenia is a disorder of energy. Okay. Um, there's a there's a, a literature in a in a large number of researchers studying abnormalities of energy in bipolar disorder. There's a number of us studying this in schizophrenia, and it's pretty clear that in the brain, in the postmortem brain tissue, that people with schizophrenia have a perturbation of metabolism. Their metabolism isn't right. It's not, it's not like in people that don't have schizophrenia. There's, there's an interesting backstory to this. And so the medicines that we use to treat the positive symptoms of schizophrenia, the, the antipsychotics, um, are well known to cause weight gain. They can cause increased appetite, weight gain, diabetes, increased cholesterol, metabolic syndrome, all kinds of stuff. And so for many years, people have just assumed that the metabolic sort of imbalances, if you will, in persons with schizophrenia were secondary to the medicines they were taking. And, oh, it's a necessary evil. We just have to deal with this put them on a diet, give them some metformin, treat them if they get diabetic, whatever, right? I, I don't think it was that callous. That's sort of my, um, I guess, poor attempt to be sarcastic because, um, and I, I should have, I could have put these slides in, I should have put these slides in, but there's, there's a study by Eli Lilly. Eli Lilly discovered, de developed the drug Alonzapine. And they did a, a six-week trial, and they published it. And you know they must have had fifty patients or something like that. And they had the usual stuff. They had the PAN scale, which is the positive and, and negative symptom scale that tells you how much you've improved or not improved on the drug. And of course, lansipine works for psychosis, and and it improves measures of of the positive symptoms. And they had a table of side effects. And on the table of side effects, they have a zero next to weight gain. And if you read the fine print, they did all these fancy statistical machinations to put that zero on there. They grouped the patients and binned them. And if they were in a certain bin, they let it regress to zero. I mean, it is embarrassing to me as a psychiatrist that a drug company did that, a drug company that makes drugs for my field. If you look at the, the next trial of Alonzapine that came out a few years later, eight kilos of weight gain, three month time point, 2.2 pounds per kilogram, that's 15 pounds of weight gain. That's the median. That means that's the halfway point. So when I consent somebody for olanzapine, what am I supposed to say? You're gonna gain an average of 15 pounds? Because if you look at the distribution, a few people lose weight on olanzapine. And I, I know one person on a related drug, clozapine, that, doesn't gain, that didn't gain weight, right? But many people gain much more than the median. So we really did a disservice to the field through this, these data. And so when you go back and look at people with schizophrenia, before they take any drugs, on average, they have abnormal glucose levels. Their glucose levels are not normal. They're starting to have metabolic derangements before they ever see alonzapine or risperidol or aripiprazole or any of these newer antipsychotics there appears to be a metabolic deficit that's part of the illness. So that's a pretty long rant. There's so many questions in the chat. It looks like I stimulated some comments. Let's see here. Let's go back. There we go. How does, we'll start with Carol Y. Uh, how does metabolism vary in schizophrenia? Um, I think your question is what's different about metabolism and schizophrenia, not like how does it vary from patient to patient? And what I would say is it appears that there, in some patients, the mitochondria aren't working right. And in some patients, your ability to process glucose is abnormal. And so the body has biochemical workarounds for that, but they can be very expensive in terms of side effects and weight gain and disease, because one of them is to have a much higher level of glucose in the blood. 
to try to get more glucose where it needs to be, right? And if the glucose isn't being taken up and cleared and the brain's not responding to it properly or can't make ATP out of it, that's a real problem. But we saw in pyramidal neurons in the frontal part of the brain, the big neurons that kind of drive everything, they seem to be broken as far as taking up glucose. So that there might be a compensation by the body to increase glucose levels where you're not allowed to have increased glucose levels that can cause diabetes, which has all kinds of sequela. Not to mention that you're probably going to gain weight and, and all the things that come along with that. Um, so I, hopefully that answers your question a little bit, Carol. Uh, Rowan has another question. Is it possible to develop schizophrenia without any genetic risk being present? Yes, it is absolutely possible because the, the genetic risk is the known genetic that came about from studying hundreds of thousands of people with schizophrenia. You could have a new de novo mutation. You could have a new copy number variant that no one's ever heard of. You could have a new combination of the little things, the polymorphisms that have never been annotated as risk factors. So you might still have a genetic predisposition. It just wouldn't be a known one. So, um, but again, Environment can cause psychosis. Um, you get you get into a concept here uh, and a concept that I would call resilience. So, um, you know, one of the best uh, ways to think about psychological resilience or biochemical resilience of, of a brain or a psyche is post traumatic stress disorder. Who in Vietnam got PTSD and who didn't? Well, people who had a history of psychiatric diagnoses were had a higher risk for getting PTSD in Vietnam. So if somebody has depression and anxiety as stressors, as part of their genetic makeup or whatever, they're at higher risk for developing psychosis, whether it's part of a mood disorder or whether it's a, a, a schizophreniform syndrome. Um, let's see. Can genetic testing identify the most effective antipsychotic med for an individual? Now that's a really difficult question to answer. So I don't want to create um, a controversy with people who are working with their clinician with some of the genetic tests that are available out there. Um, personally, I haven't found the pharmacogenetics to be super useful. So I've had a lot of patients who would say, hey doc, I'm going to get the genetic testing and then I get this report. And the report will say, hey, this patient might do better on this medicine or might do better on that medicine. I don't think that in psychiatry, with the exception of some, you know, rare mutations and in, in, in some in some areas, we've evolved to the point where a genetic test can absolutely clearly tell us what direction to go with the medicines. Now, there are people who would disagree with that. Um, there are people that order, there are clinicians that order a lot of genetic testing and use that as a starting point to avoid certain meds. So for example, you can figure out if you're a high metabolizer of certain drugs. That's something you can absolutely do with genetic testing. And that might be a reason to avoid taking one drug or the other, right? Um, because if you're a high metabolizer, it's going to get chewed up and might not be as efficacious. So there are reasons for doing it. But a test that says, ooh, you should be on aripiprazole. You should not be on risperidone. In my experience, that doesn't exist. There's a segue to this. And that is one of the problems and great challenges of being a psychiatrist is we literally are doing trial and error on every patient. So one of the things when I'm training psychiatrists, training psychiatry residents, and I see they see me for the first time, they're usually scared because I ask lots of tough questions. And they call me up and they say, hey, uh, Dr. Smith, they've got this patient, they're depressed and they want an antidepressant and I'm thinking about giving them something. And I'll say, what do you want to give them? And they'll say, mm, fluoxetine. And I'll say, why? Well, fluoxetine is indicated for depression. I'll say, so is citalopram, escitalopram, venlafaxine, desvenlafaxine, et cetera, et cetera. You get the rant. And they'll say, well, um, I don't know. I mean, I know fluoxetine is efficacious and da, 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 da. Well, why did they pick fluoxetine? Because someone else picked fluoxetine who was training them. They didn't go and read the literature on their own necessarily. We learn by osmosis and training. And so a lot of the, the, the choices, for example, how would you pick between sertraline and citalopram? 
there are very few, if any, head-to-head -head trials saying one is better than the other. So you pick one of them, and then you start the treatment, and you see if the patient responds or not. And if they don't, we try to go up to a good dose, or if they're not tolerating it, we switch the med. So this trial and error thing, if any of you have read Bethany's book, she went through this. The trial and error, in her case, was really painful. And I won't tell her story again here. If you haven't heard it, it's her place to tell. Um, but we really do a lot of trial and error. And that's, that's a real art. There's a real skill to that. Because it's not just about writing the script, right? It's about working with the patient and helping them understand that they have to be patient. You have to give the drug a chance to work at the right dose before we try something else. And that's a really tough thing to do. Um, here we go. Can antipsychotic medications make any symptoms worse or put a patient at risk? The short answer is yes. There's all kinds of bad things that can happen with antipsychotics. But before I talk about that, we get to talk about aspirin. And if we were all in the room together, I'd say, raise your hand if you've ever had aspirin or ibuprofen. And everybody would raise their hand. And then I would say, well, if you read the product insert for ibuprofen or aspirin, you'd never take it again. Exsanguination, Ray's syndrome, all kinds of horrible things are listed in the product insert for aspirin, yet it's sold over the counter. We take it every day, right? Uh, erosive gastritis. That's another big $3 word that's scary, right? So antipsychotics, and, and I'll tell you exactly what I tell my patients. I look someone right in the eye, say, this is a powerful medicine. This is not something I like to use for mood disorders. It gets used a lot. I generally save these medicines for psychotic you know, symptoms, and they potentially have a lot of side effects. And some of the side effects can be irreversible. So that the older antipsychotics are associated with tardive dyskinesia. Tardive dyskinesia is an arrhythmic movement disorder. Once you get it, it, it really doesn't go away. There are, there are some newer treatments for it that work okay, um, but there are a lot of potential side effects. There's other sort of Parkinsonian side effects. Anytime you block dopamine, you can give people a Parkinson's disease like shuffling gait, things like that. Is it is it irreversible? No, but that's something that can happen. This is called secondary Parkinsonism. One of the other things that can happen with antipsychotics is called neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Most people don't even hear about that when they get consented to take a med. Uh, NMS is, is the stuff of nightmares for psychiatrists. It's sort of a runaway, um, out of control, um, autonomic response um, where your body basically sort of melts down. It's very rare, but it's, it's potentially harmful. Again, aspirin's just as scary. So I'm not trying to scare people out of, you know, ever taking an antipsychotic, but I'm answering the question. Um, the other thing I would say is, what about things that happen with antipsychotics that are not considered adverse effects, like, you know, associated with death, but perhaps are troubling? Many, many antipsychotics, especially the second generation ones, a lot of the ones that patients right now with schizophrenia are taking paliperidone or spiridone, aripiprazole, some of the newer ones, are associated with weight gain, metabolic syndrome. That's sort of like having a smoking habit, right? A slow burn on a metabolic syndrome will eventually kill you. You know, weight gain, uh, type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance, that kind of stuff is really not good for your body. So here we go. Melanie to everyone, are delusions about poor health, bad heart, diabetes, et cetera, delusions about your health, common in schizophrenia? Dr. McCollum Smith, just a five minute yeah. warning or so. We don't want to take too much of your time tonight. You're welcome to end as early or late as you have time for. Well, I was scheduled longer than this, but that's great. Let me try to answer the questions. Then. Go for it. So, delusions about health. I would say are uncommon. Um, so you could think of those types of delusions as being more internal. And there are some named syndromes that are about internal health. Um, if somebody has a fixed belief that they have a health problem that's bordering on being delusional, we have somatoform disorders and other diagnoses we usually use for that. Um, so that's, I would say that's uncommon. I've seen it, but I would say it's uncommon. Here we go. Uh, what can you recommend to family members on their approach to a loved one exhibiting symptoms 
in their 40s and continues to deny no response as well as fearful to seek medical care. Um, okay, that's a bit, that's a heavy question. That is one of the most difficult things to do. And I've dealt with this recently, um, almost that exact scenario. It's very difficult. Um, the, the, um, the most important thing is to make sure people are safe. So for me, if someone has a delusional system, the question is, are they acting on the delusions? So I'll give you the example I use when I'm teaching medical students. So what's a delusion? If you think that Obama was born in Sudan, it may or may not be a delusion especially if you live in the state of Kansas, where half the population believes that. It may be just a fixed false belief that the population shares. So if my loved one was saying, Obama lives in Sudan, this is such a big problem. He, why is he president? Whatever. Again, I'm not trying to pick a political fight here. Just that's an example. Fine. If you sell all your belongings and move to Sudan to look for his birth certificate, I'm calling that a delusion. So it's the act behind the belief that escalates it to me as a behavior that I'd be very concerned about. So there's an inflection point. So safety, safety in psychiatry revolves around suicidal thinking, homicidal thinking, and psychotic thinking. And if the thinking rises to a high enough level, then the person needs to have a civil commitment if they're unwilling to seek treatment. How to nuance and finesse that to not be the villain is very difficult and something that you want to do with lots of help from local friends and family and experts and things like that. It's a real problem because in a lot of places, there is not a lot of mental health providers. So it's really hard to even get an appointment. So that's a tough one. All right, there's a part two, are chronic severe migraines associated with schizophrenia? Um, not to my knowledge. Um, I've not had a lot of schizophrenia patients that also were migraine sufferers probably had a couple. Um, in my experience, they don't, they don't associate. Um, chronic severe migraines are a brain disorder that needs to be treated very seriously. And there's lots of newer and really interesting treatments for that that are out right now. And then another bonus question on here from owner, whoever that is. Do you see the laws changing for family or friend intervention? You might have to clarify that. I don't know what that means. And the laws changing, we could talk about the laws. So mental health laws are state specific. So Ohio has different laws than Indiana, than Michigan, than Florida, et cetera, et cetera. And um, the, the way those laws are applied varies by probate court district to probate court district. Some, some probate court um, jurisdictions have very evolved and sophisticated processes, whereas others don't really have a lot of um, sort of institutional expertise and, and special courts and stuff like that that really understand the plight of the mentally ill. So... I don't know. I, I don't really see the laws changing all that much. For me, um, it's really hard to legislate that. I think for me, the biggest legislative thing that's out there right now, there are two things that will affect my field. One is gun control, and one is whether or not uh, the legalization of marijuana and THC is nationalized. But uh, who knows what's going to happen with that. Um, before we throw this open for just all questions and wrap up, um, these are not necessarily books you should read. These are books that I recommend to people who are interested in psychiatry, who are trainees in my laboratory or in the clinics that I work in and all that. And so what I wanted to share on here is there's a few books that I think are really interesting and a few movies. Um, the Fisher King stars the late Robin Williams and it's a very accurate portrayal of psychosis one of the few accurate portrayals of psychosis if you've never seen the movie. Um, another movie that I highly recommend if you enjoy good movies, Ordinary People, I believe won the Academy Award in 1978 for Best Picture, all-star cast. And it's, it's a story of, of tragedy 
um, and loss. Um, I believe it's Donald Sutherland, Mary Tyler Moore, um, Timothy Dalton. No, that's not right. Timothy Hutton, I think is the name. Judd Hirsch plays a psychiatrist in it. Um, if you're interested in things like obsessive compulsive disorder, just checking is excellent. Um, and then of course, there's a book down here by somebody we all know. Um, and I think that uh, some of these are more interesting neurologically. Number five and six are really neurology books. The Bell Jar is a famous book about depression. Um, the House of God is a really, uh, what would be considered inappropriate for 2023 book about being an intern. So if you wanna get a sense of what it's like in a hospital being an intern, it's laugh out loud funny, but it's really awful like politically in places. Um, and Phineas Gage is an interesting book. This is the original lesion study. So Phineas Gage was a person that worked on the railroads with a tamping rod. And they would drill a hole in the ground because they're going to blow up a, the side of the hill to run the railroad through. They, they drill a, 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 you know, about a two inch hole, and then they would push explosives down into the hole with a giant metal rod called a tamping rod. It's like six, seven, eight, 10 feet long, and it's kind of tapered on the end. And they were, Phineas Gage was working on this. He was pushing down on the rod and the explosives went off and shot the rod through his head. It went under his jaw and came out through his frontal lobe. And the energy of the event was so severe that it seared the wound and he lived. And he, his personality changed because he broke part of his frontal cortex. It's a very famous book and a very famous story. So I think I'll leave you with that. Those are just some interesting uh, uh, things. These are a bunch of the people I work with. I didn't really get into any specific data today, um, but I'm gonna stop ranting and just open wide open for questions or comments or concerns, or if somebody wants to tell me that I said something they completely disagree with, I can take it. Um, and thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. McCollum Smith. I know I learned a lot tonight. I thank you to all of you for joining us. Are there any final questions? You're welcome to speak up. Do you see much Capgras syndrome? Oh, wait a minute. Let's see here. Uh, oh, lots of great questions. All right. Do you believe in clozapine? Clozapine is a great drug. It's just really hard to take. It can kill all your white blood cells, cause seizures, stop your heart, things like that. So it's a great drug, but it's hard to take. So um, it, you need a lot of support. There's a lot of blood draws. There's a lot of education. There are some countries, Northern Europe, where clozapine is first line and everybody gets it first, where they have you know, socialized medicine and healthcare. And they're following best practices and best evidence. Um, is kidney disease a side effect of any antipsychotic? I wouldn't say it's a direct side effect off the top of my head. I think there are a couple of psychiatric drugs that can directly cause kidney disease, kidney damage like lithium. But anytime you have elevated blood glucose chronically, you can kill your kidneys. So it, it can be part of it. Um, can someone be misdiagnosed with schizophrenia instead of bipolar with psychotic feature? People are misdiagnosed all the time. That doesn't mean you are, but diagnosis can be a matter of interpretation and symptoms wax and wane. Remember, to be bipolar one, you need one manic episode at some point in your life. So you could be a 63-year-old person with bipolar disorder who had a manic episode when they were 17 and never had another one, and we call you bipolar, all right? Again, I'm picking on myself here. My field is not really with the times, right? So yeah, the, misdiagnosed is in the eye of the beholder. Does it matter? I say it doesn't because we don't treat, your, we don't treat a disease anyway. If someone has psychosis, we treat the psychosis. If they're depressed, then we treat the depression. If they're manic, we treat the mania. We don't treat the schizoaffective disorder. We don't have a drug for that. So that's another great rant. That's a great question. And then the same person, Anne Marchetti, and if they are on an injectable because of non-compliance with oral meds, will take them off the injectable, damage their brain as when they have schizophrenia. So first of all, antipsychotics 
have good evidence for working in bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. Long acting, long acting injectables have excellent evidence for decreasing hospitalizations, decreasing psychotic spells, keeping people from being manic. So long acting injectables are an excellent treatment, but it's highly individual. I can't comment on someone's specific circumstance because I'm not their doctor. But in general, long acting injectable is not going to damage your brain if you have one label versus the other. Okay. I don't know if that helps or makes things worse. And I tried. Mike, what about ECT? Well, ECT is electroconvulsive therapy that's basically intentionally giving someone a seizure under controlled conditions with anesthesia and a paralytic so that you don't shake and damage yourself. Okay. Um, ECT is something that I've done as a provider in the, in the pre-op anesthesia suite. It's generally indicated for treatment-resistant depression. It's occasionally used for catatonia, and it's occasionally used for intractable psychosis, although the data for that, my recollections are not great. Um, how common is neutropenia with antipsychotics? Um, off the top of my head, I don't know the rate. Um, I would say that uh, a derangement of blood cells is a known problem, particularly white blood cells with clozapine, but it's a theoretical concern with most drugs, with any drug, um, which is why from time to time, we will check your complete blood count, platelets, and differential. But it's not something that we really get too crazy about in terms of worrying about it unless you're on clozapine. Um, oh, this is a great question. Do you see much cop cross syndrome? Georgia, do you want to tell everyone what that is? Uh, that's believing your family members are, it's a delusion about your family members, as I understand. I was thinking a Cotard syndrome because I, I was thinking about it. Yeah, so Copgross is a delusional misidentification syndrome. It's a false belief that an identical duplicate has replaced someone significant to the patient. And it can involve an animal or an inanimate object. I have personally never seen Copgross syndrome. I've seen Cotard syndrome, which relates to a delusion about the body. It's the belief that you don't have any inner organs and your food just goes straight through. Um, but yeah, I, I've never seen anybody with Copgross syndrome. It's also thought of as doppelganger syndrome, you know. Um, interesting question. Isabel says, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, another question. Can anorexia be misdiagnosed as schizophrenia as someone who is neurodiverse since a kid and someone who is neurodiverse since a young boy and developed anorexia so lose 80 pounds in a few months? Um, anorexia is um, a really, really dangerous disease, and you're not immune from it if you have schizophrenia, nor are you necessarily more at risk. And if somebody has anorexia plus something, that's a really scary thing for the clinician because treating anorexia is a real specialty that most psychiatrists don't have. I barely can hang on with treating eating disorders. It is not in my wheelhouse. I know enough to know when I need help. And generally, I have not seen, I've probably seen one patient with schizophrenia that also had an eating disorder. More, off, more often, we see eating disorders um, uh, in, in patients with mood stuff rather than schizophrenia. Um, it's never normal to lose 80 pounds in a few months unintentionally. Um, most weight, even if you're trying to lose weight because you, you have a high BMI, losing 80 pounds in a few months is probably too fast, but that's a whole other field. Um, Nutritional psychiatry is a really interesting area. And I'll say something about that right when we stop. Will the recording be available? That is a Bethany question. It should be. I uh, will look at the recording in a few minutes and hopefully send it to all of you tomorrow. Oh, so many great questions. And I love it, Sandeep, when I get questions that I can't answer. Do negative, does exercise reduce negative symptoms? I don't know the answer to that. I'd be making it up if I said anything. What I can tell you is I prescribe exercise all the time for all psychiatric disorders. 
because there's evidence that exercise increases plasticity of the brain. It increases some, you know, secretion of some of the chemicals that promote brain health. And what do I mean by exercise? I don't mean you have to go to Planet Fitness or Orange Theory and get a membership and pump iron and get on the treadmill. I'm happy if my patients just walk around the block a couple of times every day. I'll call that, I'll take that as exercise, especially as we call it in Northwest Ohio and maybe even in the Cincinnati area, we're in the gray season where the sun is tilted away from the earth. We haven't seen the sunlight in six weeks, yada, yada, yada. So the exercise is a critical part of brain health. So let's, let's rant about that for a second. We talked about schizophrenia today and a little bit about specific meds and genetic risk. For me, and, and how the, the syndrome doesn't really capture what's going on, for me, the axis you want to be on is the brain health axis. What can I do that's making, that will make my brain healthier, regardless of what my phenotype is that I've been given by the doctors, right? And there's a lot of things we know you can do that make your brain healthier, a lot. Bethany's talked about them in a lot of her cures programming. There's a lot of things. I mean, I could go on and on about that, but that's really a brain health question. Can psychosis be treated without antipsychotics? Well, that's a loaded question. It has been treated without antipsychotics for a long time until antipsychotics were discovered. And a lot of the treatments you would now consider inhumane, insulin coma, lobotomy, electroconvulsive therapy. One of the things that they used to do is wrap people in wet sheets, like a swaddling effect. It's paradoxically calming. What I will tell you is if somebody is really anxious as part of their psychosis and you treat their anxiety, whether it's pharmacologically or, or with talk therapy, then that can help the psychosis. The other thing I would say is that there is a whole field of treating patients with schizophrenia with, with talk therapy. And the talk therapy is effective in patients with schizophrenia. And if somebody has an effective talk therapy intervention, they're probably at lower risk for having future episodes. But that's speculation. I'm not saying I've got some study in mind that's proven that. Oh my, here's a tough question. From Tracy. This is the last, we should let you go soon. This is my last one, okay. So I apologize to anyone after Tracy in the chat. All right. If someone had a violent situation pre-diagnosis of schizophrenia because of auditory hallucinations, does that mean they'll always be violent? It does not necessarily mean they'll be violent. In psychiatry, we can't predict who's going to be violent. We can guess a history of violence is the best predictor of a potential future history of violence. If somebody, when they get psychotic, has a tendency to do things that are violent, then yeah, we need to make sure they don't get psychotic. So that's kind of a scary scenario you're throwing out there, but it's not a guarantee. I've known patients and, and persons that had a spell or a homicidal or violent act and then were never violent again, to my knowledge. So it's it's not a curse. It's not, you're not stuck with it, but it's important to pay attention to. So Bethany says we have to stop there. Thank you so much, Dr. McCullough. I was listening to Bethany, so I'll stop there. And thank, uh, you. No, thank you all for joining us. If you want to join us again, our next lecture will be Thursday, February 16th at six o'clock. So if you subscribe to Cures, just look for an email about that or even write me right away and I'll sign you up. And uh, we, we look forward to seeing you again. If you have further questions for Dr. McCollum Smith, please feel free to email me. I can either talk to him or look for advice from another doctor. So thank you and good night.